In this session, we're going to be looking at the concept of serious play and the nature of developing games that have a significant purpose, particularly around educational purposes. That's where we use the term serious play from. So while play can be, as we looked at last week, many different types of play, serious play takes the focus on a much more formalized output. And in predominantly in education, of course, the focus is around learning. So we're going to look at computer games and the nature of computer games, the idea of serious play, the different types of serious games, um, a process of serious game design, and then we'll finish off looking at the broad range of um, game genres, particularly computer games. Of course, many, many people understand peripherally that there's a lot of different computer games out there, but don't have a particularly intrinsic understanding of the wide variety of genres. Um, there are as many, if not more, genres in computer gaming than there are in literature, and certainly more so than there are in movies. And understanding that can help us better appreciate the diversity of approaches that are needed in utilizing games for education. Whereas one, if there was just one type of game, then that would be one type of approach to using games in education. But there are many, many different types of games and computer games, um, and they each require a different approach and have different affordances and possibilities around education. So first off, let's look at what we mean by computer games. Computer games have been around for a long, long time, um, but essentially they are used as a form of entertainment and as a form of media. So in the 60s, computer games emerged with the development of computers. Um, they were very simple back then, often text-based. Um, and over time, as the graphical and audio capacities and music making capacities of, of computers improved, so did the, the relative um, expressions in computer games. And indeed, in some respects, computer games helped drive improvements in computing capacity, uh, particularly around graphics. So share in the Microsoft Teams a game that you have played recently, a computer game, and the genre that it might represent. What sort of computer game does it represent? So this is a little guide to some of the genres. We're going to explore these in a bit more detail um, at the end of this presentation. but. We've got things such as action adventure games and simulation games, puzzle games, sports games, real time strategy games, survival horror games, etc. So there's a range of different types of computer games. Um, not all of them are well supported for education. Uh, we don't see a lot of first person shooter games in education. That said, however, they are used for educational purposes in the military, uh, for training um, soldiers and so forth. Um, so while one aspect of education may not be well supported through the use of computer games, other genres may be used in other areas. So this is a report um, a couple of years old now, but it looks at the popularity of games in our society. Um, generally around about two thirds of our population report having played computer games in the last year. Nine out of tens have nine out of ten homes have a device on which computer games have been played. 78% of computer game players are over 18. 30 and the average age is 34. So it's not all young children that are playing computer games. 
47% of computer game players are female. And 42% of those are aged over 65. So this may challenge some of your preconceptions as to who is engaged with computer games. From my own research, I've found that teachers are actually one of the least, um, least engaged populations of computer game players. Uh, now, it may be that teachers are very busy, um, don't have a lot of free time and tend to use it for other purposes. But it's an interesting thing in terms of our cultural development globally, and this is an Australian study, that many sectors of our society are engaging strongly with computer games. Um, but we're not seeing so much in education, um, particularly K-12 education. So some of the aspects we do need to think about around computer games is that it's been shown that um, all, Almost 60% of computer games promote student creativity. And two thirds of them have been used for work training in industry. And 52% of parents say that their children use computer games for school. So computer games are being used. It's just not necessarily st strongly evident in our teacher discourse. So have a look at some of the other statistics there that may interest you. And let's hear a little bit about how some teachers have engaged with computer games. With Minecraft, I just build. It's like my electronic meeting. I think the power of gaming is that it brings people together. You are not isolated. You can have a really bad day at work or you can have something awful happening in your social life or your family life and you can get into gaming and it doesn't matter anymore. When I was very young, we'd go over to Malaysia and I wouldn't be able to speak a word of Chinese to my cousins. They wouldn't be able to speak a word of English to me. But by the power of games, we bonded over the fun times, bonded over platforming and trying to kill Bowser and keeping Mario alive and that was that was really powerful to me and since it was kind of a universal language that we could all wonder over. The most awesome thing I've noticed about the changes in who plays games is when I was a kid, games were played by a lot of boys and some girls. Today, everybody plays games, whether it's on their phone, on their PC, on their game console. Really, gaming is for everybody and everybody plays. I think the reason that we utilize games outside of just entertainment is because of the way that you can engage with it. It's, it's not just watching something, it's not just reading something, it's engaging with it. When you're reading a book, you aren't, you, know, you can be thinking about the image in your head, but you're not thinking about what do I do, what are the consequences of these actions, because it's a linear aspect, it's being told to you. Same with film. Film is telling you what's going on, uh, and you're just along for the ride. But games allow you to change that ride, uh, allow you to take a left or a right and see what happens. Games have the power to challenge students in ways that they probably haven't thought of happening in the school before. Games have the power to help students to collaborate and connect and design and build. Problem solve and just develop a bit of a grit and tenacity about approaching problems in a game. You get something wrong, you learn from that mistake, and you go at it again. Games have the power to inspire creativity, inspire a thirst for, for learning new things, and, and really engage somebody in the way that they want to be in games. Games mean, mean everything because. I've met too many friends through um, playing games and, and I've bonded with my brother over games. Video games offer something that traditional forms of entertainment or storytelling, they offer something new. So when you watch a movie or a TV show, you're passively consuming a narrative. When you're playing a game, you are actively participating in a narrative. So games are uniquely positioned to further foster and nurture empathy and compassion in players in a way that other mediums aren't. My kids try to get me into games that they're playing and they're like, please, could you download this game and join in with us? And so, you know, we'll play together. 
games mean more than everything to me. Like games are meant how I, like how I meet my husband, they're how I have my friends, they're how I cosplay. I remember the first time I ever beat Super Mario 3. Um, my mum helped me, so there was so much I couldn't do at the time. And having her sit with me and sort of hold the controller and, and show me that, it was a really strong feeling of closeness. There was this connection with someone that I got. When I grow up, I want to be a game app um, developer or game app designer because I really like making the, the game, the graphics, the coding, and how it like, interacts and moves and things like that. I find that really interesting. I've learned so much from playing games. I just think there's so many crucial life lessons to be learned from games in terms of like teamwork, um, working with other people, learning how to understand other people, have empathy. Uh, I think you can learn any, any life lesson from a game. So that was from some particularly passionate gamers um, at a gaming convention. But it does give an indication of just how much gaming can engage many sectors of our society. Now, in terms of education and in terms of work, games are being used quite extensively. Um, this is again a report looking at the percentages of people that have used games in their workplace and 36% have used it to gain new knowledge, 31% in health and safety training, 30% um, in workplace rules, learning a new software, learning new skills. So it is being used in educational purposes. In schools, we're also using it, um, but not necessarily extensively. 52% uh, of students are reporting the use of games in schools, but that's not all the time and um, in all their learning. But 26% have reported having made their own computer games in schools as part of their curriculum. And 23% have used games in co-curricular activities beyond the formal curriculum. So games are being used within schools. It's just how and to what extent um, is what's developing. Now, a recent development has been around the use of esports which is competitive computer gaming as an alternative or as a um, authentic sporting event. And indeed, esports are now the, the major sporting event in the world. They'll be included in the next Commonwealth Games and there's work being done um, to include them in the Brisbane Olympic Games. So esports are dramatically transforming the nature of sport um, sport entertainment uh, and you'll find many students engaging a lot of their free time their leisure time watching esports events uh, watching other players compete against other players um, not participating necessarily themselves in the game so it's quite a big phenomenon and there are a number of schools now developing esports teams um, and having competitive teams both in high schools and primary schools. And most of the Australian universities now have e-sport teams and are being supported with training facilities and coaches um, at their universities. So in terms of educational uses, games have traditionally been mostly used to motivate students, to get them to engage with content that is not necessarily inherently engaging. Um, but it can also be used to inspire students to be creative Games themselves open up a whole range of different interactions with the traditional curriculum. Students can write stories about their gaming characters or the settings that their games are setting. The geography of the games can be a focus around understanding geographical processes, likewise the history. So there was a whole range of different aspects that could be explored, even in things such as health and PE and dance. I did some research around the use of virtual worlds and computer-based avatars for the teaching of dance, where students had to actually animate their avatars in terms of the motions of the limbs and their movements. And in doing so, for a game, they learnt more about how to actually move their own bodies in performing similar movements. 
So there are a range of different opportunities to explore the use of computer games for teaching and learning. So some of the big things are the creativity aspect. It's probably number one. Um, there are opportunities for students to engage with and explore ideas through computer gaming that are difficult in other mediums. Even literature, which is traditionally an area and the arts where they can paint and so forth, being able to create things within a game, being able to tell stories and engage with the story in an interactive way in a game can do things that a lot of literature cannot. It also allows students to um, support their well-being. Now, that's always been a, a negative around computer games, where it was seen as being traditionally fairly sedentary, where students weren't going outside and playing and being physically active. But more and more computer games, particularly with virtual reality and um, interactive devices that students can move around, and also mobile devices, games can incorporate physical movements. But the main focus is around um, engaging their brains. Um, TV watching is seen as a very passive set at entry activity. Playing a computer game, the brain has to be active. It's generally engaged with problem solving or challenging processes rather than passively watching and consuming content. So that's quite a different um, cognitive process than other set at entry leisure activities. The game has a range of different um, processes involved in education, uh, particularly around simulation and gaining confidence and risk taking. Risk taking is something we do very badly in education, but computer games are inherently built around the concept of risk taking. The idea of failure and overcoming multiple failures is a, is a fundamental mechanism of computer games. Whereas in traditional educational processes, Failure, even on the first attempt, is seen as a negative. Um, and then there's also the economic benefits of computer games. It's a major industry, and it's going to be an increasing industry. It's now bigger than the movie industry by far. Um, and there are going to be an increasing number of jobs available. And Australia is one of the leaders in computer games. We develop a, a wide range of computer games in Australia and have a number of computer gaming companies. So other aspects. It needs to be just acknowledged that computer games are here to stay. They're in most of our homes. Um, most people play computer games. Uh, so education needs to incorporate that aspect of society. Um, there's also the aspect that we looked at last week around the concept of play providing more and more opportunities for students to actually engage in playful activities, not just formal learning activities, not just work, but play. And a lot of learning can occur through play. And computer games are a great expression of that play and the opportunities that are inherent with that. There's also great opportunities for connections. Families can play together with computer games. Um, parents can teach children's values and language and activities um, through gameplay. But also students can engage with um, other members of their close connections remotely. They can play with their grandparents online. Um, they can play with their friends overseas. It's a way of increasing connections rather than what was once considered a solitary disconnected um, engagement. And there's also a power of community. Students get involved in communities when they play computer games. Um, and some of these com communities can be hundreds of thousands of people, but others can be small groups of three or four where they regularly play together and engage in challenges and quests and gameplay. So a whole range of different affordances provided through computer games. But in education, we want to focus on what's called serious play. Now, this is where the play has a non-recreational purpose, where we're attempting to achieve a specific outcome. 
Now, there are a range of different educational games, um, political games. There's also political games, evangelical games, advert games for other sectors. But for education, we have what are called serious play games, where we're trying to engage students with learning outcomes or with the achievement of learning outcomes. So some of the types, the first is what's called adver games. Um, now, these types of games are used in advertising by, by their name. Um, and they often trigger various emotions or interest in purchasing things. But we can use similar processes to support learning, where we can embed within games um, maths concepts or well-being concepts, teamwork concepts, like what we'd have in posters around a wall in a classroom. So they're, they're influences on students. There's edutainment, where it's a, a blending of a um, recreational game with some sort of learning outcomes. Then there's game-based learning, where the, the specific learning outcomes are designed into the game. And then there's what's called the edu market games, where there's a whole range of games that are trying to achieve specific um, goals. So Food Force is one which is trying to teach students about healthy living and healthy food. So it's got a specific agenda and it's built a game around achieving that. There are some news games, which are journalistic type games. Um, and these take students through various um, cultural or historical events. For example, September 12th was one that looked at the events of September 11 through news reporting and a game-based interface, but it was very journalistic in its approach. We also have a whole range of what are called simulations and simulation games. This is where students get to um, engage with something real world in a simulated way. Now, it may be something like flying a plane. Um, it could also be something like running a city. Um, the SimCity range of games is very popular. There's also ones around transport, running a small railroad. Um, but they teach students a whole range of different skills and concepts and understandings that are very difficult to achieve in any other way. SimCity has been a wildly popular game for many, many years. And it involved business management techniques of a dozen different departments that would be um, found in a small city. Now, expecting a 12-year-old to run a small city and manage um, water departments and fire departments and healthcare systems and education systems and planning departments would have been inconceivable outside of a game-based environment. But within a game-based environment, students can get a quite a good understanding of those concepts um, through that gameplay. There's also persuasive games that try to persuade around a particular agenda or issue. Um, some of those are, there's, well, there's a couple out at the moment around particular military conflicts. Um, there's been persuasive games around um, refugees and getting, us, getting players to have a different perspective on what it is to be a refugee and the challenges that refugees face and the opportunities that countries can provide to supporting refugees. Um, there's also organizational dynamic games, which help generally older um, players explore how organizations work. And there's games for health, um, looking at physical rehabilitation, um, particularly and different training processes and training regimes, uh, fitness programs. So lots and lots of different types of serious games. So these aren't used for entertainment purposes. These are used for specific learning outcomes. A few more extra games are used for exercise by their name. There's some art games that involve creating artwork and art productions. Um, also music fits in with that genre now. Um, some productivity games that focus on to-do lists and gaining scores and ranks. Um, they're often used in 
companies that have a high productivity focus, um, where players doing their real world jobs gain points and, and things of that nature. And we'll talk a bit about this in terms of gamification as well. Training and simulations we've also talked a bit more about um, and so forth. So there's a whole range of specific games that are called serious games. But how do we design these? So we're not going to look at designing necessarily entertainment games, although many of these processes can be used for that. But I'm going to take you through a particular set of processes for creating serious games. In our perspective, educational games. So lots of different processes available. This is just one, but they all follow the design cycle. In this particular process, um, it has a focus on four different elements accessibility, uh, working alliance, uh, learning in <laughs> immersion, and computer games themselves. So all of these different elements uh, make up the framework for this particular model. So it starts with a conceptualization process, looks at some content, a thematic approach, um, the constraints that are built into the game, how much time players will have, uh, resources available for developing it, all those sort of things, and some particular goals that the game wishes to achieve. And then there's a process of looking at what's possible in terms of researching and the various game mechanics that are available to put in place. Then once the conceptualization phase is done, there's generally some play testing so getting some people to sort of explore whether or not the game is, is effective or not. And then it goes through a more formal design phase where the art and visual concepts are developed, um, the assets in terms of the imagery and sound effects and all the rest are built. And what's called the product or the level design is, is conducted. Um, many games have increasing complexity levels. Then again, some prototyping is done is done and some alpha testing on uh, with some players again and then it will finally go into production so that's the basics of game design so you're going to go through a process similar to this um, and it will go through three phases a pre-production phase which involves brainstorming and coming up with a paper prototype a production phase where the game is developed conceptually and a post-production phase where it's tested and refined before being offered for learners. And I've provided you with some tools on the website that you can download and put this process into place. And it can assist you in developing your assignment game, um, your choose your own adventure game developed in Twine. Now, it's not necessary to do this for your assignment. Um, it's simply a tool and a mechanism to assist you with your creative processes. Um, and it's about all there if you wish to follow it. So first off, we have pre-production. And for this, we use a template of a circle divided into four quadrants. And we look at four different issues. The learning, the storytelling, the gameplay, and the user experience. So you can read through what those mean. And this is what it looks like. So the top quadrant is um, looking at the uh, the learning, I think it is. No, the learning's on the left. What have we got? Storytelling's on the top. And the user experience is on the bottom, where you can't see the names. Um, so the user experience at the top, looking at the stories and experiences that they'll be involved in, the choices that they make, the imagination that they engage with, and the interactions that occur as part of that storytelling process. Now, that's certainly fo a focus of your Twine-based Choose Your Own Adventure story. Then there's the gameplay elements where you've got various levels of engagement, the dynamics of the tool, um, the actions that the player takes, 
and the genres and mechanics and strategies that they employ to maximize their um, success in the game. Then you've got the um, processes around the interface, um, the controls, the feedback and the sensory experiences. Now this one's less so for, for the um, text-based choose your own adventure, uh, unless you incorporate some images, um, generally you're going to be restricted with text, but even with text, you can use various textual elements, um, uh, punctuation, uh, spacing, um, things of that nature. Um, you can change the color of some text. So there's elements you can utilize to still engage with that sort of interface. And then there's the learning. And this is probably the most challenging bit for those outside of education when they come to developing um, games for learning. And it's where we see a lot of games for learning fail because they've been developed by game designers, generally those from an IT background, that don't have a good, um, a lot of strength in learning. But you need to think around the, the learning outcomes that are going to be achieved, the pedagogical approach that's going to be used to achieve those learning outcomes, the learning experience of the user or the player or the student, and what they're being taught, what the content is that they're being taught. So these are things you need to consider as a very brief abbreviation of the learning, of learning theory. But altogether, they form the things that need to be considered around developing an educational computer game. Now, there's some processes to assist you with this. In that set of circles, the innermost layer was around the designer's story. This is what you as a designer um, include that the player doesn't really have any decision make, making ability over. Then the middle layer is where the player and the designer interact, where players choose things that have been offered by the designer. Uh, players might be able to make some contributions in some games. And then the outmost layer is where the player is completely on their own. This is their experience in imagining what, what might be happening in the, in the game. Um, and the designer doesn't have a lot of control over that aspect. So looking at the layers, you can see those three different aspects. The designer has got a lot of control over the imagination of the, of the story. The player makes some choices and have some interactions, but the experience is the players is in the player's control, how they experience the stories. So again, that's how you can interpret these different layers. So for gameplay, the player has got control over how much they engage with the, the game. The designer can choose the genres, the mechanics and strategies that can be employed within the game. And the player's actions and the dynamics that they have during the play are a merge of the designer and the player. Okay, so that's conceptualization. Then we need to brainstorm some ideas. You know, Many students have difficulty in coming up with ideas for a new game. So I've provided you with some techniques and tools to assist you with that process. So we have two stages of brainstorming. It's an iterative process. The first stage use, uses a few concepts, and then the second stage will build upon that with a new set of concepts. So there's some cards that you can um, download and print out, and that will assist you with the brainstorming process. Um, so the first set of ideation cards contain questions to be answered and placed around your conceptual framework, around the, the circle. Um, so you can download that and answer those. So around what is the taught content, what content is being taught by the game and how you would answer that particular card, etc. Once you have answered that first set of cards about your game, then you would address the second set of, of cards, which are the ones with, well, the, the first set have the solid border and the second set have the um, open border. That's just an example of how 
um, a, one student has used post-it notes to plan out their game responses. Now, if you can't answer a question on a card, place it at the bottom and then come to it again later once you've answered some of the other questions. And you should then start filling up your quadrants with responses to the various prompts. And there's a provided um, glossary to help you understand the terminology. And for those of you that don't have a strong educational background, I've provided you with Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning to help you set learning outcomes. So engage with these um, tools to assist you with your brainstorming and coming up with ideas for your own computer game. So the second set of cards will then um, build upon the ideas that you developed in the first set. And will help you address some of the questions that are useful um, in better understanding your computer game. Finally, oh, so the next stage then would be coming up with a paper prototype. So this is essentially just a storyboard of what your game would be like. Now, in the game design environment of Twine, you could plan it out on paper first, but the Twine environment allows you really to prototype as you, as you go and make changes and rebuild and redesign as you develop your interactive story. So it really builds the prototyping process into the development process. So if you've gone through this process and used the circle and your cards, it'd be great if you could share a screenshot or a photo of your um, model into Teams. And finally, I just wanted to take you through a very quick um, exploration of the wide variety of game genres. Uh, now, while for your assignment, you're being limited to a particular genre of choose your own adventure, it still has various subgenres within that. It could be based around a physical location of moving to different places and interacting with things um, in terms of an interactive map. It could be a more traditional story-based narrative of making decisions and interacting with other characters and so forth. It could be a game where you're interacting with concepts and having to make decisions around various concepts as you progress through the story. Um, so there's a whole range of different approaches and looking at these different game genres may prompt you to think of other ways of engaging with the tool of an interactive story in and mixing it in with other game genres. So, first one of these is called Stealth Games, where you've got to sort of sneak through and make your way through a particular environment. Then we have fighting games, where characters try to hit each other or combat each other. You've got survival games, where you try to last as long as possible within a um, challenging environment. You've got survival horror games, which are the challenging environment is a horror-based genre. There's text games, of which the Twine is a, an example. And these often involve a, a mix of role-playing and fiction writing, where you undertake a character that moves through um, uh, an open world. But it doesn't have to be that. There are a range of other genres that are possible within text-based games. Interactive movies are another, where you're experiencing a, a narrative and um, being able to adjust the, um, the flow of that narrative as the story progresses. There are full role-playing games where you take on characters and interact with a virtual world, and there's lots of different types of role-playing games. You can explore those in more detail if you wish. There's a sub-genre sub of 
role-playing games, which is called the Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Games, or MMOs. Um, and this is where you have um, hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of players um, playing online at any one time in the same world. There are ones called tactical role-playing games, where they're a little bit more strategic and focus more on the fighting and the tactics involved in um, most commonly combat. There are things called sandbox role-playing games, which are essentially role-playing games where there's no established rules and you can go off and do whatever you really want to within this space. There are strategy games. Chess is an example of those, but there's lots and lots of others. Um, some subgenres of these are ones called 4X, which are explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate games. Um, there's grand strategy games that are often uh, war games. There's real-time strategy games where you don't get to pause the game. It, it continues on and you have to um, uh, interact with the game and with other players um, without pausing. There's ones called mobile online battle arenas uh, where you have small teams and they tend to com combat one another um, across a, a battlefield that's fairly constrained. Um, but it's much more about the strategy of which characters you face against other characters. And it's actually one of the most popular for team-based um, games, uh, for uh, eSports. Tower defense games are quite popular, particularly on uh, mobile devices, which and they involve trying to have a defensive fortification survive as long as possible against ongoing waves of attackers. There's a whole range of simulation games. Um, we've got vehicle simulators, um, these can be things such as trucks or farm equipment. Of course, there's also planes and spacecraft and racing cars. City building games, as we've talked a bit about. There's life simulation games, such as going to um, school, going to university, going on holidays, um, buying a house, living, raising a family, having a job. Lots of different types of simulation games around the life sim genre. Party games, which involve lots of sort of generally um, familiar interactive activities such as bowling or um, playing darts or Mario Brothers, like simple driving simulators, but they're designed for a more um, party atmosphere with small teams competing against each other. Trivia games, puzzle games, uh, more traditional board games, sports games, team sports games, combat sports games, which sort of take the team sports games and add an element of physical violence, racing games, all the different genres around that, uh, first person shooters, which tend to be the more controversial ones in relation to education. Um, but they generally involve um, moving around some sort of battlefield and shooting other players or monsters. Tactical first-person shooter games, which are more military focused. Then you've got rhythm games or musical games. Platform games, where you move around, jump over platforms and move up staircases and things of that nature. Educational games, they get a mention. Exercise games. And that's it. There are others, but they're by far the, the major genres. And I hope they provide you with some uh, more food for thought around the wide variety of computer games that are possible and the different educational applications that these different computer games might be able to provide in various learning opportunities. 
So, try out the um, interactive game design tool and work on your Twine interactive story for your assessment. And that's it for this week.